It's time for another episode of the Steven Universe podcast. I'm Mackenzie Atwood here in the Steven Universe Writers Room at Cartoon Network Studios in Burbank, California. And today we're going to be talking to some former Crewniverse members who had a huge impact on Steven Universe and have gone on to create their own shows. Ian Jones Cordy was a huge part of Steven Universe from its inception, and now he's doing his own successful show, OKKO. OK we'll talk to him about what it was like getting Steven Universe made and how he used that experience to help him get OKKO OK off the ground. And of course, we'll talk to him about OKKO OK and what's coming up there. And I've also got Ben Levin and Matt Burnett. They were writers on Steven Universe, and they're now getting ready to launch their own series, Craig of the Creek. We'll find out how the process has been for them to get their own show up and running and how Steven Universe helped prepare them for this journey. We'll also see what they can tell us to expect from Craig of the Creek. Okay, so here we go with Ian Jones Cordy, who's the creator of OKKO. And you also worked on Steven Universe, right? Yeah. What was your job title on Steven? Uh, I had several, but I ended as co executive producer. So, like, what kind of, uh, what parts of Steven, Steven Universe's DNA, like, as a show, mm. you know, what kind of, what came from you? Oh, man. <laughs> um, it's tough because, uh, it's so much of a big stew and, and I was working on it from so early that like it's almost kind of hard to extract the me parts mm -hmm. from Steven Universe. Um, I had a lot to do with uh, the pilot. I was unofficially doing like a lot of re revisions and story help on the pilot. Uh, I, I even like boarded several sections of the pilot as well. And then let's see, after the Steven Universe pilot hit and we were going to go ahead I joined uh, Steven Universe with Rebecca. Rebecca's my uh, girlfriend of like almost ten years now. So wow. we we and we have like a background of uh, working on stuff together. We always kind of helped each other with our projects. When I was doing like web cartoons, when I lived in New York, Rebecca used to like jump in and be like, "Let me animate a piece of this." Um, when she was doing comics, at the same time, I would jump in and be like let's work on this story. Let's like make sure that everything sort of works together. We've kind of been like creative partners uh, for just a really long time. So when Steven was starting, we kind of made a pact with each other. Um, you know, if Steven Universe becomes a series or if OKKO OK becomes a series, we would find a home for each other uh, in each other's projects and sort of find a way to work together. And so I really sort of, I sort of had like a handle on a lot of like the technical elements. A lot of the stuff I was figuring out at first were sort of the, uh, you know, the kind of like brass tack stuff, like what the design should look like, like how, how do the characters transform, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like a ton of like small things where we kind of just worked on them together. And I also storyboarded a lot of the early episodes and... In, like, several of the episodes, like, I would jump in and board a sequence. I was in every single pitch. I would uh, work on the dialogue with everybody. Uh, I was in the writer's room, like, every day. Uh, we sort of came up with a lot of the story together. There are a lot of things in this story which are based on Stephen and Rebecca and their childhood. Mm -hmm. I like to look at uh, their childhood and their family life and sort of what is the spin on an outsider, someone who loves Steven and Rebecca and kind of like bring that into a world that's completely built around that relationship. Gotcha. Um, and yeah, I'm sure there's, I mean, there's like specific things that I could talk about, but like as an overall, like Steven universe is like really personal to me. Right. So it's kind of hard to, it's even kind of hard to break out which parts of right. my DNA. Yeah. 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 I got you. So you guys worked on the the pitches at the same time then for Yes. Uh, yeah. OKKO OK and Yeah, yeah. We pitched OKKO OK used to be called Lake Plaza Turbo. It's a pilot. You can watch it on on the Cartoon Network YouTube. But yeah, we worked on them together at the same time. And we were uh we had a crazy month where we were also doing mini comics at the same time because we wanted to go to uh a comic convention in San Francisco and sh and like have a bunch of mini comics and stuff. We were doing that, boarding our pilots, and we were moving to a new house like oh all gosh. within the same month. 
Uh, and we just were like, we, we were just, but we were just having fun. We were burning the candle at both ends and just like working every day. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's awesome. And now you both, now you both have a show. That's now we crazy. both run shows. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so with, uh, with Steven, were there any concepts, like since you were involved so early, were there any concepts that you, you felt that you had to cut, um, that felt really tough at the time, but then ended up. Like, if you look back at it now, mm. it's like, that was, what were we thinking? Right. Well, <laughs> actually, wild. I mean, what's kind of fun about Steven Universe is that we kind of always felt like good ideas can kind of come from anywhere in mm-hmm. the process. And a lot of things that they seemed like scrapped ideas, we would end up going back to them and using them much later. Like, gotcha. for instance, like... We did this whole scrapped board where uh, it was about sort of Steven's identity. And in that episode, we like we did tons of things. We did Steven having magic dreams where he's like sort of having like a psychic connection with someone. We showed Steven bouncing around on pink fluffy clouds. We showed Pearl like driving a car. We showed <sighs> Amethyst transforming into a cat. Like every single one of the th- of the concepts from that episode, we ended up reusing uh, later in the show. Gotcha. Yeah. So like a lot of times uh, when we were in the writers' room, we would write stuff and then be like, "Ah, this isn't quite right." But then like forty episodes later, we would be like, "Oh, now we know why we did <laughs> right, that." Right. Right. Like a classic example was uh, Cheeseburger Backpack. Uh, when we were writing it, we sort of were like. This is uh, Steven and the Gems kind of going on, like, a test mission for Steven. Uh Uh, And so they are kind of going to, like, sort of, like, shepherd him along and, like, show him the ropes of, like, how to go on a mission with the Gems. Right. And uh, it it was fun, but I think, like... Maybe when the episode is done, people were sort of like, why are they babying Steven so much? And mm-hmm. it was 40 episodes later in the test that we were like, oh, you know, we can actually go back now that we have the space of right. doing like a whole series. We can go back and kind of explain like what exactly was that mission? And then we reveal that it really was a test that they mm-hmm. were they were putting Steven on. And we had written it that way, but we never thought we would get to explain it. Got you. Yeah. See, there was a lot of foresight. I had I had no idea. I figured it was just yeah. like a sort of a, <laughs> a retcon or something. I you mean, know? we never, we just never got to, at the very beginning, so the first 26 episodes, they end with um, mm-hmm. a Mirror Gem and Ocean Gem. And when we were writing that first season, we thought that Ocean Gem was going to be the last episode ever made. I mean, because we didn't know if there was going to be more. Right. So we tried to take advantage of, we only had 26 episodes. So we were like, we're just going to cram everything we can into these 26 episodes. You meet everybody, you meet everyone in the town, you meet all the gems, you find out a little bit about their backstory. And then the um, reveal that, the corrupted gems used to be gems just like everybody else and that gems were actually aliens was gonna be the end of the show like that would be it like there wouldn't be any more after (sighs) that and we were like hey look we got one shot at this thing let's just do it but then we got more episodes and then we really started thinking like well there are things in those in those first 26 that we couldn't expand on Mm -hmm. so we ended up kind of going back and doing like sequels to our old episodes right yeah i i felt like um one of the things i when i'm introducing people to steven i actually show them mirror gem and ocean gem pretty early on just because it's like the first look you get at like oh right like there's something right there's something going on here you know mm-hmm. you don't know are the gems good or the gems bad who, right, who right. knows you know it, it really added a lot of depth I, I totally that's really cool i didn't know that it was like um Initially, the, it's supposed to be the, the yeah. finale. Yeah, yeah that's that was crazy. Gonna be, that was going to be the end game. So, what was like the the mood of the crew and you guys when you were when you were developing that first run of twenty six? Oh, it was great. We actually we had a lot of fun. We were on a uh, Cartoon Network has uh, two buildings, and they had they had a new building at that time, which is actually where OKKO is, and we were on a floor that was basically empty. Uh, There was, like, nobody else on half of this entire floor. And um, let's see. They were finishing up work on the Powerpuff Dance Pants special there. And they were a skeleton crew. 
And so we just got to sit in with them. And so it was basically just like we were just trying to put this st- staple this thing together. Uh, All right. Me, Rebecca, Ben, and Matt would sequester ourselves into a corner office and just try to break all of the stories. And that's actually where we like came up with Mirror Jam and Ocean Jam and like a ton of the other stories. Um, we were just writing every day and uh, coming up with stuff. We found a, a free Ocean City webcam that we put on the computer in the writer's room and we would just watch it just for inspiration to be like, <sighs> what's it like living in like a small beach town? Oh, like a 24-7 webcam? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we... um. We were just all working there. Uh, it started uh, with just a few of us, and then Stephen. Well, it was me, Rebecca, and Stephen at the beginning. Stephen got to work on the world building, and he would draw these maps, and then we would look at them and come up with ideas for episodes. And then eventually, Cat Morris and uh, Paul Vallejo joined, and they started working on storyboards. We had like some really rough storyboards at the time. Uh, I had done uh, Together Breakfast and Cheeseburger Backpack, and he sort of worked on sort of forming them into full stories. Yeah, and uh, it was just really fun. It was like very scrappy, small crew, and we would play video games at lunch all the time. That's awesome. Yeah. So, like, you kind of you kind of made this whole like this group, this core group of the like a it's like a graduating class almost, you know, <laughs> like looking at uh, the crew, yeah. and then Matt and Ben who have gone on to start working on their own show too. Like, what's yeah. it like seeing that? Honestly, it's just part of working at Cartoon Network. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cartoon Network is really good at recognizing the talent that exists within the walls. Mm -hmm. and then working on new things for them. So when you sort of look, I mean, for us, Steven is not a um, nexus point, at least for me. You know, Steven was born out of, you know, Rebecca was boarding on Adventure Time. I was boarding on, you know, Secret Mountain Fort Awesome. And I was like a storyboard supervisor on Adventure Time. Uh, And people left Adventure Time to create several, like, different projects and shows. But then even Adventure Time itself was, like, the sort of um, had an ancestor in Flapjack. uh, Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack. And even Flapjack was a nexus point for several different shows. Flapjack's crew included people who go on to make Adventure Time, regular show, Gravity Falls. I mean, like, you know, that was also a nexus point. So for me, it's like shows and creativity begat more shows and more creativity. And that was always like the thing I felt about working on these shows is that if someone has a place to go and if someone has like an idea, like you got to support that person. Like when I was when I was pitching OKKO again as like a full series I would pitch the episodes to the Steven Universe crew and see, you know, what did they laugh at? What didn't they laugh at? And we would talk about my idea and, you know, they always helped us along. And Ben and Matt, when they started their project, Craig of the Creek, they were like pitching us concepts in the room and coming up with their characters and showing us the character designs really early on. I mean, you know, the whole, it's just like, you know, there was a thing that, um, uh, the creator of Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack, Thurip Van Orman, whenever like you asked him, like, hey, can I come along to record? Can I can I see what it's like to like call retakes or like work on the animation? Mm-hmm. He would be like, It's a fun factory. You know? <laughs> and he'd be like, Come on, my friend, let's go. It's a fun factory. And and, <laughs> and I always kind of felt like, you know, that is how this should work. It's like a fun factory. We're all trying to like be creative and work on cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks, Ian. I, I want to talk to you more about learning from Steven and launching KO, but first I'm going to talk to writers Matt and Ben, and then we'll come back to you right after that. Cool. What's up, Doc? What's up is that Boomerang is the best place for kids and parents to watch their favorite cartoons. Zoinks! And Boomerang is the only place for Scooby-Doo. Anybody have a Scooby snack? Looney Tunes. Duck season. And so much more. Well, that don't beat all. <laughs> Just go to boomerang.com or download the app to start your free trial now. All right. 
right, guys. I am here with Ben Levin and Matt Burnett, who were writers on Steven Universe. Thank you guys so much for coming in and talking to me. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yes. Pleasure. So what are, what are the jobs of uh, writers on a board-driven show like Steven? Uh, so on some shows that aren't board-driven, uh, what happens is a script is given to the storyboard artists, and they go off of you know the dialogue that they're handed. Um, since it's board driven, that means that we give them outlines instead of scripts. So our our job is to come up with the stories for the episodes mm-hmm. and uh, turn like ideas that Rebecca had, ideas that we all like were throwing around the room, and make them into a, a story that has a beginning, middle, and end that we can hand off to the board artists that gives them a skeleton of what they can start to build off of, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. for the uh, for their episode. Yeah, and then the boarders will go off and do the boards, which is. They're, they're, they're writing the dialogue and stuff, and they pitch it. They put it. They put it up on the TV, and they pitch us through it like it was an episode. And we get to sit with Rebecca and the directors and give comments and see things that you know maybe that didn't work in the out or that that worked in the outline but not at board. And we make adjust and we punch it up. We make jokes and we do all kinds of suggestions for it. And um, yeah, we just it's a very collaborative process to work with the board artists to get uh, the episode where it needs to be. Yeah, so the, yeah, it's just basically it's the story. We come up mm-hmm. with the story uh, and trying to figure out, take an idea and be like, can this be 11 minutes? Uh, is this enough? Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of times where you come in with a great idea and you're like, oh, man, we'd love to see. Uh, like, I wanted to put, I think, I don't know if I just wanted this, but that I, there was a drawing of Steven in a suit of a prawn for a while. Uh, and yeah. I was like, I want Steven <clears throat> to wear a suit. And we're just going like to put a shrimp. In a bunch of suit, <laughs> suits like Mario. Yeah, and I was like, that'd be cool. But, like, there was just no story. There was not enough right, story there. Right, there wasn't there. any. There's no shrimp, yeah. So what did we do with that? So it's be finding a way to make an idea into a story. And mm-hmm. then, yeah. yeah. So what have, what have been your favorite characters or arcs to write? Gosh. I mean... <laughs> Um, I really yeah, liked. Uh, well, I mean, I like, I like writing for Ronaldo and for <laughs> Kevin, uh, just because they're such different shades from what we usually do on the show. But that's like kind of the contrarian answer. But uh, the Amethyst arc that capped off the stuff with Jasper, that was. Uh, a, I really enjoyed working on that. I was really proud how that came together and you know it felt like amethyst was a character who really needed a strong story and 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 needed some fleshing out at that point in the series and i I hope we delivered on it i just had a lot of fun working with that and the bond that she shares with steven and when they finally fused together uh it was was cool yeah yeah Yeah. i like that i was affected (laughs) good i like i like ronaldo yeah i mean ben and i just love (laughs) writing for ronaldo because he's just like a complete nerd uh and you just get to write all kinds of nice stuff i mean like writing the you know writing on the show is just such an experience but every every part of it like the arcs that we did had a different kind of problem to tackle so they just all were fun in their own ways because the beginning of season one was fun of just like building like how do we explain this world that rebecca's created and then you know when we got to do paradox arc i think was a lot of fun of just challenging ourselves to hit sort of uh just like little milestone episodes to tell this story and uh, lay out like her change over time and everything I, that was a lot of a lot of fun and also the this human zoo arc oh yeah it was a lot of fun because it was just like every episode was picking up where the previous one had yeah. left off and that it was yeah like that was a challenge for sure but that yeah, was, it was cool, it was a cool thing that, we've done yeah cool thing to try i liked it so do you guys remember anything that was really hard to cut at the time but then ended up being for the best yeah, cuts happen a lot. I think the biggest cuts felt like they happened when we would either hand out a board or the board artist would make the cuts. Because otherwise mm-hmm. it would be yeah. all in, like, breaking the story. Gotcha. Like, we would just be like, oh, we want to tell this story. And then you're just, you start thinking about it. And you say, you know what? This act one is just way too long. And before we even write it down, it ends up cut, you know? So mm-hmm. that, that would be when the most of our cutting would happen. In, right. In the talking, just talking it out phase. Right, yeah. And the board artist would make cuts for a, a variety of different reasons. And, like, I remember in Message Received, when, uh, that's the episode where, like, Paradox calls Yellow Diamond, right? Mm-hmm. Like, we had written in the outline this, like, huge slapsticky chase w- between the gems and Paradox where they're, like, the control of the communicators going like back and forth, back and forth. And we just like written it out and written it out and sort of like the board artists, I think when figuring out the episode and like everything else that had to go into that episode, it's just like the time 
that that would have eaten up. It just maybe wasn't worth it. So they just had Amethyst turn into a helicopter yeah. and dogpiled Peridot and solved it that way. And that was something where I was like, oh, like you, you write it in your head. And like that's the tough thing about sometimes being a writer on these shows is you like write something in your head, but then you're really having to ask people to draw it. And if you're sometimes it's just as like, yeah, it's just not going to work. And it doesn't it, translate. You, yeah, it doesn't translate. And, and you got to understand that and work with them to find something that works for everyone. So that was one thing where I was like, oh, I really like how that wrote, but I'm really glad that, you know, it just didn't eat up time at the end of the episode. We just were able to get to what people really wanted to see, which is uh, Yellow Diamond. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that, like, maybe, was it Joe and Jeff had mentioned, like, Sirius Steven? It kind of, like, changed a bit or something? Because I remember at the beginning of Steven and the Stevens, there was supposed to be something they were fighting to get the hourglass. Like in the oh, outline, like, there was like, yeah, there was like a monster that they were going to, like an octopus monster oh. or something. And I think at the handout, when we, when we that's when we give the outlines to the board artists, I think they were like, that's too much. Yeah, I think that was maybe a common <laughs> thing in like that first run of episodes where maybe there was just uh, every episode kind of had a little bit of an, not every episode, but a lot of episodes started with extraneous monster of the week kind of monster stuff. Of and the then week, yeah. as, you know, Sirius Steven and that episode uh steven and the stevens like as we were cutting them at board i think as we were writing we realized like oh maybe we don't need these things because we keep cutting them out you know the 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 monsters fell away a little bit the biggest cuts would be the episodes that we wrote and then we didn't do that there Mm -hmm. were ones like that like uh there was uh twice we wrote like sort of a bunker episode that ended up not happening. What do you mean? Uh we wrote in we wrote an episode where Steven, Lars, and Ronaldo were all trapped in a, a fallout shelter that Ronaldo had made and he like <laughs> he like somehow accidentally locks them in and so it was sort of a, a episode about Ronaldo and Lars like Yeah, and then there was an episode we wrote with Ronaldo, Steven and Sadie in a similar kind of like lock-in situation and it was just like I don't know if it was just funny that it was like what if we put characters in the same space as Ronaldo for an extended <laughs> period of time and watch them completely crack uh, anyone anyone would do that yeah I in the know. same I've, space as Ronaldo yeah so the, those hang. So those are ones that we wrote and then they're you know we decided not to do um, and like the this this we did eps we wrote an episode where Steven was a bottle Oh yeah, the, what? it was just a because we were like, let's. Sorry, in, t- some- in TV, in TV, there's something called a bottle episode, which is this idea that like, oh, this episode all takes place in a bottle, meaning you're using pretty much all existing elements. Like uh, an episode that takes place all in Stephen's house. Like we've designed Stephen's house completely. We don't need to do any more backgrounds. Mm. It's all characters we know. No new design work. It's bottle. And so we were like, we need to. We should do some more bottle episodes. Yeah, what about an episode where Steven turns into a bottle? Yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> and then, like, he's like a bottle, and he's, like, getting passed around all over Beach City, and he gets to see, like, inside the lives of all these different people, and they don't know that it's him because he's just a bottle. And then at the end, we were just, like, we just created, like, 60 new locations in Beach City. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is no longer yeah. a bottle episode in the sense that we need it to be. <laughs> you, st- you also have to design him as a bottle. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it was, like... It was like he was experimenting with shape shifting oh, yeah. powers. Yeah. And so he tried this. But then there's also a lot of logistics of like, can you drink out of Steven? Like, what is happening? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that just also made it complicated. But I think we ran with that one for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, sounds too like it's not even real. Like, that's so crazy that. <laughs> that's, that's why it didn't become an episode. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I think that, you know, ultimately it's decided does this feel like a Steven episode? And. I guess it didn't. Yeah. Would the bottle have had hair, eyes? Where would the gem have been? Would the gem shrink? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Too or many. Just a bedazzled bottle. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what what episodes uh, do you think changed the most from the conception to the finished product? The one, I've talked about this before online a little bit. Um, I think that Marble Madness is one that comes to mind a lot, where we were writing this the Peridot sort of arc, and we knew that we wanted Steven to find an underground lair in the kindergarten. That was like the plot point we had to hit in the episode. And so we, but we initially like, it started off like completely different. Like they go to the kindergarten and there's a, one of those marble robots that Steven finds, but Steven falls down a hole with it and he befriends it. Or he's, I think maybe he's like, 
it's it's sort of like we were playing off the fact that Steven has so many pets, so it was kind of like he has a lion and now is he gonna have a robot pet? And just like <laughs> feeling like he's he's like, I don't like you robot, but you and me, we're stuck in a hole, we're gonna get out of this together, I guess. But after we get out of the surface, we're not gonna be friends no more. And then by the end he's like, I can't help but, you know, like your robot, like he befriends <laughs> yeah, everything he sees. He befriends everything. But that didn't work. And then we just um we I think there was like five different versions of that outline before we came to the version where the gems are just battling these droids that these robinoids that um you know paired out sending it out one after the other and until steven is finally like let's just follow them and see where they go which yeah it turned out to be just a story about like listening to steven and accepting the unknown but that was way different right so what was it like branching off to do your own thing when you you started with craig of the creek uh it's uh huge yeah <laughs> right know? it's exciting i think that like we on steven rebecca is this like arbiter of like okay what what is steven what is the feel of the show you know and now like we're the ones like you know you have to make yeah. these big decisions of like what's in character what is this and that but um we on steven we were lucky enough to be like rebecca let us collaborate so much and um being on so many parts of the process that we know so much of how a cartoon is made because we were there from writing to uh the boards to record sessions to animatics that we really know so much of the process so mm-hmm. it felt like we were really prepped and ready you know for our own show uh, Crank of the Creek yeah it's working with Rebecca was great to see how she runs a show and I feel like we've tried to kind of take take some of the stuff that she did and just try and yeah like yeah and she's such a great collaborator of like you said just letting us in on every step of the process yeah i think if if she hadn't been so collaborative we wouldn't have known so much of like how a show is made and how how, to you know all this stuff so it's really like awesome coming from steven to be able to do our own thing and learn from her but yeah it's it's like it's different being uh like you're the when you're we're writing we were just like trying to like all right what what is it what are you what are you feeling rebecca like what is Uh it that you know you know looking to someone yeah what do you need you know and now it's like okay what do we what do we want what do we want we have other sometimes it's a harder question you know i don't know yeah (laughs) what is gonna be the right thing because you're just sort of the gods of the the world right yeah Yeah, yeah. that's crazy yeah it's super exciting and yeah really uh excited to just um yeah yeah tell a story of a different world yeah it was sad to leave steven though it's really cool that we're going to do our own thing, but it was sad to leave Steven. But uh, we're fortunate enough that uh, we were able, like, I feel like they were, like, trying to get us started on our show. And we were like, no, wait, we just got to give this little input One on last this thing. last yeah. thing. So we, the, the the season that's airing right now, we got to write on all of that. Um, yeah. So I'm nice. glad that, I'm happy with what we wrote. It looks like there's, like, a graduating class, you know, from, from Steven, because... Because you guys went on to make your show, and and Ian's now on OKKO, which obviously was sort of a thing for a while. But what's it like having the sort of Cartoon Network alumni family setup that you have? Oh, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, it's great. (laughs) It's great. You know, it's like it's how it's because Rebecca was on Adventure Time, and everyone comes. It's the only way to do it. Making cartoon show is really, really insanely. Hard. Ben and I used to make uh, cartoons ourselves in our apartments in Queens way back in the day, just the two of us. And we were like, yeah, we know how to do it. We have our own production pipeline. Like, yeah, we can make a cartoon show. And then we came out here and started as just writers. And you just see, like, on a production this size, like, how much more is involved. And it's just, it's just so great to see that, like, people are coming, uh, homegrown people are coming up here and, and, and are, you're learning the process as you climb the ladder. So when you become a showrunner, which is, like, really tough job it's not a complete out of nowhere thing and yeah and it, the creative sensibility here that everyone shares is great and it's and but so different it's just great to see all these different people who collaborate on steven getting to kind of do their own thing and and, and spread it out yeah. taking what they learned yeah mm-hmm. yeah well, that's awesome thank you guys so much for coming on and talking to me yeah yeah thanks for no having problem. us thanks for having us So Ian Jones-Cordy is still here with us, and coming up, we'll talk to him about the pilot episode of OKKO and how the whole series kind of came to life thanks to a video game. We'll also talk to Ian about the differences in creating and writing for OKKO versus Steven Universe. So more with Ian Jones-Cordy after this. All right, we're back in the Steven Universe writer's room with Ian. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around with yeah, us. Yeah, no problem. Uh, do you remember the moment when you found out that after all this time, OKKO OK was going to be made into a game? Yeah, it was awesome. 
so we had done the pilot and a lot of people talk about like dead pilots oh they're never going to do anything with this right. but uh actually lake plaza turbo just never died it sort of stayed around sort of in the ephemera people really liked the characters and they liked the world and uh, a lot of people were just like what do we do with this thing mm -hmm. and um we had like a lot of conversations and things sort of organically came together basically cn games had had relationships with a lot of like smaller indie game studios and they found uh this great studio double stallion who had actually done a um a beat -em up game already and uh they looking at it it was kind of like why don't we do an okay ko version of this right. and it just made sense I was really shocked that we were doing it, but the more we talked about it, it just was so gradual and organic. It just, right. you know, it just came to be. It was like, oh, well, yeah, yeah like, yeah, duh, why not? It yeah, just, it just made sense. <laughs> Do you remember when it when you found out that it got made into a show? Yeah, well, I had been working on several versions of it. I'd done the game that was coming out good, and then for the launch of the game, we made three uh, two minute shorts. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, coming out of when we were making those shorts, there was really like people started to understand sort of like the voice of the show and what the show was about and the show's point of view. And so there was a lot of push behind me to like, hey, maybe you could have a go at developing this as a show again. So I had been working on that uh, for a while. I had enlisted the help of Toby Jones, who was a former regular show storyboarder, and he also did his own short called AJ's Infinite Summer. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and uh, we were just working on developing the show. And uh, we had just finished this summer of really just, like, working our hardest to get this show together. And then Rebecca and I uh, decided to do something we, like, never do, and that was take a vacation. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, we actually we went on a vacation to Japan, and it was my first time being there, and it was oh, that's awesome. awesome. And uh, we got, like, we were in, like, this Airbnb in the Japanese countryside and connected to, like, their very weak Wi-Fi, and we had a <laughs> Skype call, and they told me that the show was real. And I was just what? like, I didn't know what to think. Oh, my uh, God. It was a very surreal moment. It was super fun. And I was just excited that I was going to get to work with a lot of talented people and make it real. You're like, I'm just out here in Japan. And, like, the connection <laughs> is wobbling. And you're like, D uh, you're breaking up. What are you saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So, so did you approach it differently than you did Steven Universe? Just, like, did you, like, what did you learn from Steven that you then? Right. Like I adjusted think, your approach. So uh, that's that's an interesting question because I think um, you know I think there's multiple ways of looking at a solution. Uh, there's goal oriented ways and there's process oriented ways. And for Rebecca and I, we have very similar goals. We wanted to make this show that was fun and charming and like had this expansive world of characters and had like this nice core of this fun family unit and like you know we really like just got into that kind of feel and we have a lot of the same inspirations and we like a lot of the same stuff so our goals are the same though i do think that our processes are a lot different rebecca generally she creates a world from the inside out so this it kind of started with the idea of steven and then we sort of started expanding the world like steven what's his family like right. like what is his town like what is his world like what is his galaxy like it sort <laughs> of like came from the inside out it grew from this small thing mm -hmm. i i tend to to come thing come at things from the outside in i like to imagine an entire world and then imagine all of the systems in the world and all the people in the world and then who are the characters in the world and then who lives in this world and what is their life like from living in this interesting world? Gotcha. Um, and on Steven Universe, we attacked it from those two processes at the same time. Oh. So as we were developing the characters and stuff, we were also developing like the universe and the world and what goes on in it. Like, what is the logic of this world? And right. we kind of like met in the middle with this like show. And I would say that. 
you know, OK, KO definitely when I was doing the pilot, Lakewood Plaza Turbo, the first thing I drew uh, from it was the world. So like I drew like a little map of like, oh, this is Lakewood Plaza and this is Boxmore and they fight each other. And, you know, that was sort of like the genesis of that. And then I had to sort of work smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller mm-hmm. until I got it to like, what is one character's point of view on living in a world like right. this? Right. It, yeah. it reminds me of like the difference between inductive versus deductive reasoning right. kind of. Yeah. Just like starting big. That's really interesting. Yeah. And it reminds me of also what you're talking about with Steven building the, the world yeah. and the map and everything. Absolutely. Um, that's awesome. So how now that OKKO OK is launched, Having been through the Steve, yeah. the early days of Steve, yeah, finally it's launched, right? Uh, and congratulations again, oh, by thank the you. way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, now having that having launched, uh, how does it compare to the launch of Steven? Do you think? You know, it's different. I think that Steven Universe has blazed a trail in a way that's it's hard for me to state how influential it's been for me and for a lot of other people, even though we were working at both things at the same time. The fact that Steven Universe exists now, it makes people's experience with OKKO like different because mm-hmm. they understand what Steven Universe is. And I would say that a lot of the kind of things that Steven Universe is about, this sort of like kind of action comedy centered around not knowing a lot about the world and coming into your own as you find that sort of thing yeah people sort of already have people already understand what that is so because okko and steven universe kind of share dna when they see that dna inside steven uh or rather when they see steven dna inside okko it's a place they've kind of been before and they can Mm -hmm. kind of recognize those sort of things Uh, and then uh, again I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Steven Universe was the beneficiary of Adventure Time, right. which also has sort of a expansive uh, fantasy world that a character is learning how to navigate and growing up at the same time. Mm-hmm. So obviously, I would be remiss t- to mention <laughs> Flapjack, <laughs> right. which you know it's all sort of like a. Um, it's all it all builds on each other and mm-hmm. I, I see myself as, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. So yeah. yeah. It's really cool I think how how Steven like you said, it, it, they all build on each other, but at the same time Steven and KO were developed, you know, yeah. sort of hand in hand. So yeah. um they really they really complement each other, I Absolutely. think. It's really good. Yeah. Um what makes OK KO its own show, do you think? Mm. Oh, well I would say uh OK KO OK KO is a little different. I think um in Steven, you have a threat that uh, it's not 100% defined. And part of the mystery of the show is figuring out exactly what that threat is. Mm-hmm. You think you understand everything about Steven and his struggles at the beginning of the show. Oh, he's tracking down artifacts and fighting these corrupt gems. But then you peel away the layers and it's like, oh, the threat is actually a lot bigger than this. We're talking right. about... A, a, a galactic conflict and then you peel back another layer and then you're like wait a minute what is going on in this galactic <laughs> right. conflict like there are confusing things with the characters pasts that you don't quite understand and you're kind of all fitting the puzzle pieces together mm-hmm. i would say that okay ko is a little bit different so it's a world where almost anything can happen it's a magic world swarming with superheroes and 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 robots And something about a world where anything can happen is that you do have to find a simple conflict to have the whole thing kind of revolve around. So there's more mystery about the people who live in the world as opposed to mystery about the threat of the world. Right. In OKKO, the threat is very defined. It's across the street. (laughs) Heroes fight robots. That's all we know. Fighting is currency. They fight robots. It's a lot of robots getting punched and exploding and like it's just it's just (laughs) there but i do think that they come from a similar place Mm -hmm. that's sort of anything for a joke what is the coolest thing we can do right yeah okay cool thank you so much for coming in and talking yeah absolutely thanks for having me (laughs) 
And that wraps it up for this week. Thanks again to Ian Jones, Cordy, Ben Levin, and Matt Burnett. I'm so excited about the new episodes of OKKO and to see what Ben and Matt have created with Craig of the Creek. And coming up next Thursday, we're diving into the Steven Universe production process. How does an episode get from conception to the finished version we all see and love? We're going to find out from some of the crew universe who were instrumental in the process. Producer Jackie Buscarino, production manager Lisa Zunich, animatic editor Lauren Hecht, animation director Nick DeMeo, and of course show creator Rebecca Sugar. They're going to give us an inside look at the journey an episode takes to animated completion. So go ahead and hit the subscribe button at Apple Podcasts or whatever app you listen to podcasts on so that you don't miss the Steven Universe podcast. And please be sure to leave us a review and five-star rating at Apple Podcasts. We love the feedback. So big thank yous to Smooth Like Butter, Kate, Friendship 101, Seriously Man, Eric Brooks, Sebastian the Stuff Lover, Riptide vs. Clay, and Jamie Kramer for taking the time to leave us comments and five-star reviews. I'm so glad you're enjoying the podcast. I'm definitely having a blast doing it. So keep listening. We've got more great episodes coming. And thanks to everyone for hanging out with us. I'm Mackenzie Atwood, and I will see you next Thursday. Thursday.